Welcome to another episode of The Edited Chef. I am your host, Steve Anderson, and we are bringing heavy metal to your stove tops and to your lives. I've got an awesome menu for you guys today. I know I say that every week, but check this out. We have uh, soul food. I'm tapping into my inner redneck. Uh, I'm, I'm actually from the South. I was born in Vero Beach, Florida. Didn't spend a whole lot of time there, but it's in the blood. So we're gonna do, um, we'll do a nice soul food presentation for you today. We do fried chicken. We're gonna show you how to hand bread it and fry it yourself. We're gonna do a nice, I wanted to do catfish, but we're gonna do a tilapia because that's a sustainable fish. And uh, it's very similar to catfish, so we're gonna do a Cajun tilapia. We're also gonna do some sweet potato fries on camera. We're also gonna make a homemade hush puppy. And then we're gonna throw a bunch of sides that you might've seen in other episodes, just to kind of wrap up the dish. So stay with us, it's gonna be amazing. Check this out. So what we're gonna start with is I have a, uh, a whole chicken quartered up. We took it and quartered it ourselves, but you can buy it split in the grocery store. And all I've done is I've laid it out on the tray here. We're gonna go ahead and start the marinade. Now there's a couple different kinds of marinades you can use. The real down south version is a, uh, is a nice buttermilk marinade, but uh, you can also brine it. I find that you put it in salt water, like a, um, take about a quart of water, add about a quarter cup of salt, kosher salt to it, and let it sit in that overnight. It gives it a real nice flavor as well. But the traditional way to do it from the southern version would be with buttermilk. So I've got about uh, about two cups of buttermilk, maybe a cup and a half of buttermilk here. We're gonna put that in there. And we're just gonna kinda enhance that buttermilk a little bit with a couple different flavors. I've got some accent here. We're gonna add about a teaspoon of accent. And I wanna give it a little bit of a shot of spicy sauce. You can use, uh, there's some brand names that you can use, but I wanna give it like maybe just a couple of dashes of uh, like a, a hot sauce. You could use your favorite hot sauce if you'd like. And then, uh, and then I'm, I'm gonna finish it off with about a teaspoon of our signature blend the edge, but you can just do a salt, pepper, garlic, try mix kind of a thing. So then what we're gonna do is, we're just gonna lay these pieces right in there and we're gonna set them aside because we want them to sit in there. Ideally, you wanna do this overnight, do this the day before. But if you can give them a good hour, then they'll, they'll, uh, they'll have plenty of time to marinate in that love and be able to fry up the bread real nice for you. So we're just gonna make sure all the pieces get coated equally around, make sure the, the surface area gets covered with that buttermilk because what's gonna happen is it's gonna suck up all that flavor that we just added there, so. These pieces are huge, it's gonna be nice. So when we fry them, we'll talk about how we're gonna make sure that they're cooked all the way because uh, when they're that big, you definitely don't wanna have them come out raw at the end. So but we'll talk about that as we get there. So okay, so I've got them sitting in this nice, we're gonna set this aside switch gears and get right into the next component. So a hush puppy is, uh, is very simple. It's like a little fritter that we're gonna fry up and they serve it with pretty much everything down south. Uh, we're gonna make a real nice one and uh, we're gonna add some fresh vegetables to it and what we're gonna do is we're gonna fry them up. They add a new dimension to that hush puppy. It's really good. Uh, you can make a standard hush puppy with uh, just cornmeal and flour and sugar and, and buttermilk and, and that's it really. And then they spoon them into the fry that oil and cook them up. But we're gonna add some love to them today and make them real sexy. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take two eggs and we're gonna scramble them up right in our mixing bowl. That's gonna be the foundation for our hush puppies. <clears throat> Got a little bit of shell in this, we'll get that out of there. Right. Now, I've got a fork here, we're just gonna scramble that up. Then what we'll do is we'll add, I've got about a half a cup of uh, kernel corn and probably about maybe two tablespoons of fresh chopped parsley. And I like the kernel corn in there because a hush puppy is like a, like a cornbread fritter. So that kernel corn adds a nice little uh, dimension to it. It adds a nice sweet, the corn really comes through and adds a nice sweet flavor to it. Uh, I've got about a quarter cup of diced green pepper, bell pepper, and a diced red bell pepper. Now we're not gonna make this spicy, but you can if you want to. You can always add, certainly add jalapenos to it and make it like a, uh, a spicy cornmeal fritter. But uh, what we're doing here is I've just got those vegetables in there and I've got about a quarter cup of diced white onion, and I also threw a teaspoon of minced garlic right into that as well. So what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna mix this up, and then we're gonna fold in our dry ingredients. 
And I also have some buttermilk on standby. And it's, tr it's tricky because it's, it's so hard to tell exactly how much buttermilk you're gonna need. You, we're really gonna do this one by eye. So what I've got here is I've got about two cups, a cup and a half, I would, I'm gonna say a cup and a half, of uh, self-rising corn meal. Uh, you can get that at the grocery store. If you can't find self-rising corn meal, uh, if you add a teaspoon of baking soda to every cup of regular corn meal, it would be virtually the same thing. But uh, to buy the self-rising stuff, with all the bread machines that are out there today, it should be pretty easy to find. It's a self-rising cornmeal. And same thing with the self-rising flour. I said one and a half cups on the cornmeal. I'm going to say two cups on the self-rising flour. And that, it's like an all-purpose kind of baking flour. So we'll add those. And we're also going to add a cup of granulated sugar. And we'll mix that right in. Now, if you want to see what this looks like, it's going to be real tasty. It's going to be real clumpy. That's OK. That's where the buttermilk is going to come in. I always get nervous with baking because baking is really down to a science. So we're really just kind of incorporating a lot of those dry ingredients in with those vegetables and the eggs. And as you can see, it almost looks like the beginning stages of a biscuit. And I reserved about two thirds of a cup of buttermilk and we're gonna add it slowly until we get the right consistency. So I'm gonna add about half of what we got here and we'll see what this comes out to. And that might even be enough. Oh, we're gonna need a little bit more. So we're gonna mix this right in. Let's see how it's really starting to come. It's starting to look like uh, like a muffin batter almost, or like a dough. I'm gonna add just maybe about another tablespoon and a half of buttermilk. But see, I didn't use all that buttermilk. Be careful not to add too much because then you're gonna throw the ratios off on the uh, on the mixes. So yeah, that's the right consistency. You want to be able to take a tablespoon into it and pull up a spoonful of this batter and be able to drop it right into the oil and have it fry right up in there which is exactly what we're going to do right now. So we're going to take our spoon here and just prepare to, to spoon that dough right into the oil but let's how do we test the oil to make sure that it's ready to go? We're going to take a pinch of flour and just drop it right in and if the flour fries right up, if it flares right up, that's the best way to tell. So that, that dispersed really quick, so we're good. Now I've already started doing some frying in this, so this oil is already really well seasoned and good to go. So we're gonna drop the, uh, drop the fritters right in, one spoonful at a time, and they don't have to be pretty. They're gonna be little balls of deliciousness by the time we're done. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna load up the bottom of this pan. And it, it fries right up just like fried dough. But those little veggies in there with, the, with the, the corn and the peppers and the onions, ouch. Be careful that, and be very careful with that because you don't want it to splash up and hit you like it just did to me. So when you drop it in there, drop it in very, very slowly. All right, so you get the idea. Now, we're going to flip them on the pertongs. We just want to make sure that we're getting all sides covered. Oh, yeah. Look at those. Huh. Paula Dean would be proud. <laughs> all right. So we're just flipping them over because we want to make sure we get that golden brown on both sides. Yeah, baby. And I have the tongs in here to flip them because you can get a good handle on them and turn them. And then I've got the spoon to pull them out. So get a nice metal slotted spoon to pull them back out of the oil here because we don't want to, uh, we don't want them to overcook and they will do that. So we're gonna just go ahead and take them out. And I've got a, I've got a uh, paper towel lined plate just to catch the extra, extra oil that comes off of them because we wanna, we wanna have something to kind of pat them dry. Um, even though we're frying in vegetable oil, it's still a good idea to get as much of it off of the product as possible. Bob hates that word when I say product. I'm sorry, it's I'm just so used to the kitchen. All right, so now we're going to pull the fritters out. We're going to switch gears and get right into, we're going to set these aside and we'll get right into the uh, sweet potato fries. So I've got some sweet potato fries here. And what I've done is I've taken regular whole sweet potatoes. I've actually left the skin on and I've cut them about a quarter inch 
and I cut them probably about three inches long. Uh, there's a tool that's called a mandolin. You've probably seen some of the food cutters on some of the food shows, the infomercials and things like that. They have different tools that you can use to make these cuts. Um, I highly recommend making an investment in one. There are a bunch of good ones out there. Uh, if, if Bob's okay, I'll make some recommendations on the website. You guys can check it out. But, um, but it'll give you a more uniform cut. You know, it, it's always great to sharpen your knife skills and get to that point. But, um, but it's always nice to have something handy in the kitchen that you can use to make that cut too, like a die cutter. Um, so that's all I've done. And what I did was I soaked them in water um, originally just to keep them from turning brown. But now I've drained them and I've dried them. And what I've done is I've pat dry them with a paper towel, primarily because water and oil don't mix. So you don't want to take a wet potato right out of the water and go boom, because it's just gonna it's gonna make a mess and you're gonna get burned and it's gonna be nasty. So um, so pat them dry, you know, drain the water all out, pat them dry with a paper towel, make sure they're good. And then um, and there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Now with, with um, when you're frying homemade hand cut French fries. Um, in, in the grand scheme of things, you want to par fry them first at 120 degrees for 10 minutes, and then um, and then you take them out and you cool them down, and it's just a big glob mess on a pan. And then you're going to take them back from that and drop them back into a 350 and fry them again, and make it crispy and make it firm and look like a French fry that you, you would expect to see. But with me, I like to just go start to finish, especially when it's sweet potato fries, because the starch content is a little different from a baking potato. So um, I'm just going to go start to finish with the sweet potato, and you'll see what that's all about. But I recommend again that slotted spoon for protection. And we're just going to take a, a handful of these guys, throw them on the spoon, and just slowly drop them into that oil so you can see what's going to happen there. Fry these bad boys up. And what we're going to do now is we're going to just keep adding some of those dried potatoes because I want to have a nice full pan. But see how it's flaring up already? We've got to be careful. And then I've already patted dry the water. That's whatever moisture content is in the potato itself. So we've got to be careful. I'm not gonna add any more, but we're gonna, we're gonna play with that amount for now. So these literally took four minutes to fry up, and I'm gonna pull them up because that oil, that recovery time of that oil was so good. We, we paused in between and let the heat get into that oil and bring it right up to temp. So uh, again, the best way to tell if it's ready is to, to, uh, to throw a little bit of flour in there. You can see the flour swimming around. If it swirls, that means you're good to go. Uh, so I'm taking them out. I'm gonna take them out a little bit at a time here. And what we're gonna do is we'll switch gears and I'll get into the next thing. But just, I wanted to show you a demonstration of how these get fried. We've got a lot more still, as you can see in that pan over there to fry, but we'll, uh, we'll switch gears so you can see the rest of the thing. We'll be able to put that plate presentation together for you before we get too late here. So once they come out of the oil, I've got, again, I've got them on a, on a nest of paper towel to catch the extra. And I'm gonna add a little bit of our homemade edge. You can do salt, pepper, garlic. And we just wanna season these guys up. These are delicious. Oh. But see, they're, they're not too limp. They're actually pretty firm. They got a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, firmness and stability to them. So we'll set that aside. Let's get into breading the chicken and we're gonna fry that up and you'll see what that's all about. So we've got the chicken that we quartered up earlier and we've got it into the buttermilk that we talked about. But the best way to handle it is to hold it overnight in a, uh, a, a resealable container, one of those bags. Uh, overnight is the best. But if you can give it at least an hour, you'll be good to go. Uh, so we've got that. We're, gonna, we're actually gonna start to bread that now. And what I've got here is I've got three cups of all-purpose flour. And I've got a spice blend here. And it's actually got 13 different spices and it's on the website. You'll see it over here on the website. Just click on recipes and you'll be able to find it. And, uh, and it rivals uh, our buddy Colonel Sanders. Take that Colonel Sanders. He's only got 11, but we've got 13 in ours. So we're gonna add, uh, so we've got three cups of the, um, the all-purpose flour, and we've got just about a cup of the consolidated flavors. And if, if you uh, if you look over at the recipe, you'll see the 13 different flavors. And as we add them to that, it builds up to about a cup's worth of seasoning in general. So now we just want to mix that up. And uh, I'm using my fingers here to mix that up. And we're just going to dredge our chicken pieces through, and we're going to go right into the oil with them now because that oil is still good and hot. So. You want to dredge it. By dredging, I mean you just pull them and drag them through the flour and then shake off any excess. And we'll take that piece and drop that right in the oil. And as you can see, it sizzles right up. So now we're going to add another piece and do the same thing. We're just going to keep doing that to all the pieces. And the greatest thing about what we're doing here is what we want to do is we're just going to kind of mark them in that oil. We're going to finish them in the oven. So that way they don't overcook because some of these pieces are so big, the best way to do that is to go ahead and fry them up in here and then we're going to finish them in the oven. So 
get a good surface area coverage of, of, of uh, crispy skin and fried chicken. And then we'll finish them, we'll put them on a pan, put them in a 350 degree oven, let them go for maybe about 20 more minutes, and that'll, um, that'll finish them right off. All right, so after about five, let's say about four or five minutes, you wanna make sure they're good. See how that's nice and golden brown? We're just gonna give these guys a turn in there. We wanna make sure that uh, we cover all the areas because we're gonna go in this pan here and let them finish in the oven. That wing there looks like it's pretty much done. Put this piece in there. Let that go just another minute. Yeah, see how big that piece is? You really want to give that the ample time in that oven to make sure that's good and cooked. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and we'll take this. We'll pop this, like I said, in a 350 degree oven for probably about 20 minutes or so. But the best way to tell is get one of those kitchen thermometers that you can get in one of the kitchen stores. You want the chick internal temperature of the chicken to read 165 degrees at the thickest point. So that's the best way to tell. You can always take a knife if it's just you with the family at home, cut it in half to make sure it's cooked all the way through, but then it's going to dry out. So the thermometer is technically the best way to go. So we'll fire this in the oven, we'll finish up with the fish, and we'll be all set. So I've got some tilapia here, and you can do either catfish or tilapia because they're both good southern fish. Uh, another one would be bluefish, would be another good one. Uh, but the, for this application, we're going to do a Cajun style, uh, and this would be perfect uh, for the, the thinner fishes because they'll cook right up in the, uh, in, the, in the pan when we pan fry it. But, um, so what, I've got a homemade Cajun spice, which you will also find at the recipe page over here. Um, and I don't think this has, well, actually I think this has a few more than the, uh, than the, than the fried chicken recipe. But we're going to go liberally and we're just going to sprinkle this right on the fish. And that's, that's about the size of a tilapia filet right there. We're going to go liberally and sprinkle this right on the fish. And we've got our pan preheating over here. We want that pan good and hot because the trick is uh, we're going to do a, a kind of a blackening almost. And I've got a little bit of canola oil here. We don't want too much oil because we don't want too much spatter, but we do want the pan to be good and hot because we want to get the good uh, good color on this fish as it's cooking and really that's all we're going to do is we've got this dry rub on there and we're just going to add this right to the pan and I'm going to do the same now a wine would poach this and that would be okay too but remember the uh, the concept the idea is to do it blackened style so you really want to try to cook this fish without any extra moisture if it's possible the dry rub really all you want to have. And because this fish is so thin, it should cook right up. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to flake up for us with no problem. And um, a couple of things that you could do with this would be a nice Louisiana aioli. And an aioli is almost like a, like a mayo, it's like a flavored mayo, like a tartar sauce almost. But a Louisiana one would have things like a, if you think of like a mufaletta, it would have things like, a, like capers in it or some sort of a pickling agent, like a dill pickle caper, maybe a little avocado in it, and, uh, and have to puree that in with some mayo and some garlic. Uh, that would help to offset some of that heat. It would be a nice, uh, a nice addition to dip that fish into. It's called an aioli. All right, so I've got these in here now. We're ready to flip them here because as you can see, look at the white climbing up the side of the fish here, uh, and that's a good indicator that the other side is going to be good. And uh, don't stand directly over it, because if you breathe those dry rubs, the dry spices in, boy oh boy. But see, look at that, it's got a nice crispy outer shell, and that's really what we're going for with the blacken. Um, some other ways that I used to blacken in the hotel, to give you a better, a better blackening, a better seal, would be a uh, cast iron pan, because it, it uh, disperses the heat a little more evenly. But this is nice, for what we're doing here, this is perfect. And we're not going to need to add any extra moisture to this pan. It's going to uh, it's going to cook up exactly like we want it to. The fish is going to be completely cooked, and it's going to flake right on our fork without any extra moisture at all. Just because the, the fish the fillets are so thin, and, uh, and the quality of the you know the the, the 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 pan and the way it's heated, everything is balanced out perfectly. So we're um, we're going to just let this cook for another maybe another 30 seconds on this side, and we're going to be good to go. So I've got this blackened tilapia here that we're going to add to our show plate. We're going to finish this whole dish off here. It's going to be out of control. All right, this is my my soul food, simple pleasures uh, from my childhood. I've got 
Okay, I've blackened tilapia. I've got the fried buttermilk chicken. I've added some mashed potatoes that you can find on a prior episode. Our sweet potato fries. We've got collard greens cooked in ham hocks. And we've got a winter greens uh, recipe that you can follow along and do something similar to that. We've got our hush puppies. We also have a, a coleslaw recipe that we made on the clam bake. So we've got a nice diverse medley here of food that we've done in prior episodes that you, didn't get, you don't have recipes for that you haven't seen yet. So this is our soul food presentation. We paired it today with a Toasted Head 2009 Chardonnay. And we, we tested a couple of different wines and we thought we were nervous about a Chardonnay with this because of the oakiness of Chardonnays normally. But as we were cooking it with the, um, with the collard greens and we add that ham hock in there, the ham hock is a nice smoked collard and it added a nice smoke flavor to the collard greens. Uh, this cut right through it and it actually brought a lot more sweetness from the wine right out. So, um, so we thought this was, was going to go perfectly with the, uh, with the whole setup. So, so if there's something you'd like to see us prepare on the show, email me personally at, at chefsteve at anodizechef.com. And uh, to find out how to support the show, uh, click on the support page on anodizechef.com as well. I'd like to give a shout out to my boys at in As Time Will Tell for two sides to every story, the song that you're hearing in the background, today's episode. Thank you very much for joining me in my magic, madness, and mayhem. We will see you next time. Oh yeah, that's right, dude.